Good morning and welcome to uh, a special interview today with Tom Crowley, uh, founder and chairman of uh, the Crowley Maritime Corp. And when I say founder, I mean it's been a family company for over uh, a century with different elements and stages of the company's history and now facing a new and extraordinarily exciting uh, challenge in how to tackle the U.S. offshore wind industry. Tom, uh, good morning, and thank you and, and to all of your colleagues for your engagement and joining us today. Oh, thanks, Evan. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to uh, telling you a little bit about what we're up to. Fantastic. Well, let's get right into it, uh, Tom. In the long and, and distinguished history of, of Crowley Maritime Corporation, you've had different phases and new beginnings of, of corporate activities. Through this historic lens, how did you and the team uh, start to consider the U.S. offshore wind energy industry? I'm, I'm really trying to get a sense of how you started to scope the market and size up the opportunity. Sure. Uh, let me give you a little bit of history. Um, uh, Crowley has, has always been focused uh, to support the energy industry from, from the early days in San Francisco Bay um, uh, up, to, up to Alaska and the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, uh, coastwise um, moving, moving product, um, and then uh, offshore Gulf of Mexico, uh, working to support the offshore uh, developments there. Uh, globally, we've had exposure to Russia, West Africa, um, many different parts of the globe, usually getting uh, 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 energy infrastructure to places that are very, very difficult to get to. So that's, that's the history. Um, I'd say that um, the, the wind, offshore wind industry has been um, uh, growing in the U.S. very, very slowly up to this point. And uh, we've, we've been involved with it. Um, on the periphery, uh, learning about what's happened in Europe over the past 10, 20 years, uh, and, and talking with the companies that have been exploring the wind industry, the offshore wind industry here in the U.S. Um, it's, it's been, as I said, it's been slow moving, but I think what we find uh, very interesting uh, this year is a, is a real acceleration and, and what we see as a, uh, an opportunity that is, that is upon us. And uh, while we've had a, a small team dedicated and devoted to it, at uh, the beginning of this year, we created a really a new focus within our company to, to, to really double down and, and uh, get, get involved on, on many different levels uh, in the offshore wind industry. Well, thank you for that. And um, you have also uh, announced a, a very compelling uh, joint venture agreement with the Danish firm Esvot. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, that partnership, as well as I was particularly interested in the press release. Uh, you talked a little bit about the shared culture and, and values that, that you and Esva uh, have. Would love to hear more about that. Certainly. Um, yes, in, in part of our exploration of, of um, what value Crowley brings to the table, we you know, we learned that there's uh, there, there's a lot in the supply chain of supporting the offshore wind industry, and uh, we felt that in order for for us to to really learn uh, quickly and to to gain that uh, gain the um, gain, gain that knowledge uh, uh, more in depth, uh, that we needed to look for partners, and uh, we we quickly came uh, came together with SFOT, uh, very as you mentioned, a very very strong cultural fit. Um, but equally important is the, the deep level of experience they've gained in Europe uh, supporting the, the offshore wind industry there. Uh, and we, we think that uh, bringing their, their skills with um, our broader scope of, of capability within the, within the Americas uh, provides a very, very strong combination of, of both knowledge uh, and experience uh, in, in this sector. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned drawing from some of the different parallels and, and the road that uh, the wind industry has taken in Europe, um, but you've also uh, partnered with, with some really fine domestic firms as well. Um, in addition to ESVOT, you also have a joint venture agreement with Watco, uh, which is a kind of terminal solution-oriented partner based out of Kansas. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of, of that partnership as well? 
um, and some of the different learnings you feel that, that you can bring to, through, through Watco? Absolutely, yes. Uh, very similar to SPOT, uh, Watco brings uh, another set of skills to the table. Uh, also, um, certainly with a U.S. domestic focus with respect to, to rail, um, trucking, and terminal operations. Uh, but we've had a strategic relationship with Watco for, for many years now. Uh, really respect the management team there and have worked very closely with them on a number of different projects in, in different parts of the, the country. We think Watco uh, really brings a skill set that, uh, with respect to the, the land side piece of, of, of what we're looking at to support the offshore wind industry um, and, and makes us an even stronger, um, uh, st stronger resource. If I consider both of the partnerships together, though, uh, what Crowley is bringing seems quite differentiating from maybe a, um, a vessel asset uh, play or, or a dividend yield play. It, it, it feels much more holistic. Um, in some of your materials, you talk about a total life cycle service provider concept, and it'd be interesting to hear more about what that means in practice. Certainly. Well, um, yeah, you, you bring up a, a good point um, with respect to, to really looking at the, 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 the entire investment that has to be made into the offshore wind business. Uh, the construction and installation of the, of the wind farm is, is one piece, um, but, but the, 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 con the contracts and the leases are, are 15 years long. So you really, the, the opportunity is much, goes much beyond the, the, the building or the construction phase. Uh, but also the service and support phase. And to, get, to give you some perspective, the, the, the goals that have been established uh, with respect to, to building offshore wind capacity in the US um, is, is triple the insta installation base in Europe, and it's over a much shorter period of time, about half the period of time. So it, in order to deliver on that, that's a very, very ambitious goal. But we feel strongly that in order to deliver on that, one has to look at the entire supply chain and, and make, an, make it as an efficient, um, uh, an efficient approach um, as possible by combining the expertise of different companies, um, but also more importantly, coordinating how the supply chain is gonna, gonna work and operate, be able to be flexible, be able to uh, ensure that the deliveries are done on time so the construction projects aren't delayed. Um, and, and the other really important piece of this is, is the utilization of assets, the most efficient utilization of assets. Rather than pouring a tremendous amount of new capital, um, you know, at the, the first objective really needs to, to be utilizing existing assets. To the degree we don't have those, um, we're also building you know, partnerships to look at, at building the, the types of equipment that do need do need to be uh, do need to be constructed, but again, the the, the we believe that the the efficiencies are going to come from the, the combined utilization from land out to the out to the fields um, and and back again. And and without without that holistic look, um, a piecemeal approach is is just going to leave too many holes and too many openings uh, for inefficiency. And the potential for delays and and, um, and and lack of coordination. It makes a lot of sense, and I do hope that your customers also appreciate that uh, the totality of your offering and not just being able to service a single asset. Let, let's let's get a lid into the Jones Act a little bit, Tom, because I think some of the things that you uh, just touched on uh, weave through the Jones Act is kind of the the red thread that weaves through uh, much of it. Uh, prior to the emergence of, of you know, dare, or dare I say, uh, expected boom within the offshore uh, wind industry, the Jones Act was a you know fairly esoteric and uh, sleepy uh, maritime law, often used as a political punching bag. Uh, but it strikes me that the advent of uh, this this new market segment will be fundamentally influenced uh, by the Jones Act. I'm interested to hear your thoughts uh, really in, in two forms. Uh, the first is uh, the creation of jobs uh, in America and the creation of, of, of industry uh, in America through the, through the Jones Act. And the second is, is how you thought about structuring 
your joint venture partnerships and, and how effective they can be under the framework that the Jones Act uh, provides. Yeah, absolutely. No, you bring up a great point. And, uh, and yes, unfortunately, the Jones Act uh, does become a punching bag. Um, people love to put uh, different color and, and story around, around what the Jones Act's all about. Uh, but frankly, I think it's very simple. And I think it's also very consistent with what the offshore wind industry is focused on. Uh, the Jones Act is about American jobs. And uh, I know the, the, the new administration is, is, is very supportive of creating American jobs um, through the new energy policy, the renewable energy policies that they, they want to create. So, you know, I think that the Jones Act fits in perfectly, perfectly with that. It's an American jobs program, and uh, it, it, it allows us to, to keep Americans on board our vessels um, and serving our country's interests. Additionally, on top of that, the national security aspects of it um, are completely underreported and underappreciated. Uh, the fact that we do have Americans out there servicing our energy industry, our energy infrastructure, um, I think is, is, a, is a critical issue. Why would you want to turn that over to foreign interest? It doesn't make any sense to me. And anybody that, that, that tries to frame the Jones Act uh, around protectionism or uh, advantage for, for union labor or, or anything, any crazy idea like that, um, I, I think is, is, is so, so short-sighted. Um, the Jones Act is about American jobs and it's about national security. And so, so is our investment in offshore wind. It's all about national security and creating renewable energy sources for this country and opportunities for American jobs. So I think the two fit together in, you know, very nicely and, uh, and support one another. And, uh, and we look forward to making the necessary investments and, and, and also doing the work uh, with our incredibly talented and very capable American workforce. Excellent answer, uh, Tom, and appreciate your views there. Um, may, maybe just to push you a little bit more though, and, and you talked about the federal uh, government here, but it seems that the states are all, also playing uh, a really large and important role here. Um, Sometimes there's coordination, as you said, with the new administration, but it's also um, quite clear that a number of states are, are, are going it alone and, and you know, pushing this agenda on their own. Uh, again, without getting too political, can you talk about this dynamic between uh, individual states versus the federal government and maybe how the, the two can work in harmony? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the two are, are, are very much in balance um, with, you know, with respect to uh, uh, jobs specific to the states. Um, you know, we're working with our work, workforces, uh, starting first with, with training. Uh, uh, you know, many people have to be trained uh, to do the services that are going to be required, uh, and that's got to start at a state level. So we're partnering with um, uh, certain maritime academies and, and training institutions uh, to put together the necessary uh, training programs that are going to be required and, and really have that driven from, from, from a state-by-state -state, uh, basis. Um, we think that uh, you know, the, the, American, the, the creation of American jobs um, has to be supported at a, at a, at a state level, and, uh, and we're prepared to do that. Um, we just opened an office um, in Virginia, and, uh, and we're looking at investments uh, uh, throughout the region uh, to support support the industry, you know, as, as needed, state by state. Well, that's great, and congratulations on that office opening. Um, let's switch gears uh, for a minute here. Uh, it wouldn't be a, a, a finance conference if we didn't get into uh, issues of, of profitability and capital. Um, it just strikes me that you know we're. We're, we're in this kind of critical early phase here uh, where there's so much hype and so much excitement around uh, offshore uh, wind and, and renewable energy. And, and we're, we're kind of witnessing real time the energy transition. But I think it does very much have an effect on uh, the overall return expectations. Um, just if, if I reference maybe some of the ultra high bids and low returns in the dogger field, uh, in, in the UK segment. I also think a little bit about uh, LNG in, in the early uh, phases, mid 2000s, where, where some of the returns were, were tight on the long-term charters. 
How, how have you and your partners thought about uh, profitability and, and positioning around uh, the industry? And then as an addendum, uh, what types of capital do you think are gonna be necessary both in, in this early phase and then as the industry uh, continues to mature? Sure. Um, yeah, I think the, the, there is, there's no question that there's a tremendous amount of capital uh, being directed to, to renewable energy, uh, ESG investments, uh, what have you. So there's, there's no question there's a lot of capital available. Um, you know, we view that as a good thing, um, and uh, we want to partner with the, the, uh, the partners that, that can want to bring that capital in, into, into, the, into this business. It's, it's an important, I think it's an important uh, area, both from an ESG perspective and, and earning, earning a return. Um, ESG investing is not about, uh, you know, zero return. It's, 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 it's about both. It's about responsibility uh, and it's about profitability. So, um, you know, I, I think that, um, that on the one hand, you've got to have the right capital structures that provide you the, the right cost of capital. That's, that's certainly important. But on the, on the value side, in terms of what you're going to bring to your customers and the, the value proposition that you need to create uh, with your customers, it, it goes beyond a, you know, a single a vessel charter. Um, it, it really gets back to the point we were talking about earlier uh, in, in looking at the, the whole supply chain and, and looking at creating value and, and reducing costs uh, through efficiencies, um, uh, through both investments and efficiencies that you can create uh, with the assets uh, that are, uh, that are in, in, in the mix. So we want to do both. Um, we've got an, an engineering team that, that, that focuses um, you know, really on, on early stage project planning uh, to make sure that, that that we look at that full scope early on, and then we want to look at the full value chain all the way through to to servicing uh, servicing units over the over the long haul. So I, I think it's it's a two prong approach: have the right capital structure, um, and and then secondly, make sure that you're delivering delivering the value to the customer across a broader set of of um, of supply chain services. Tom, thanks. We're running a bit low on time, so I want to conclude with a broader and more strategic uh, question. We're really in the early innings here of this exciting new maritime segment, which is expected to require, as you said, massive amounts of capital, investments in, in, in new equipment, um, new partnerships, and, and new vessel operations. I think that we have the opportunity collectively as an industry to get a few things right out of the gates that will shape the industry for many years to come. Can you talk about what some of those kind of key success elements are to get right now? Well, I mean, I, th I think the, the important one is that the, the targets have been set. You know, I think that the, with respect to the, the uh, amount of power that, uh, that, that needs, to get, needs to come from renewable sources, that those goals have been set. And, uh, and the timeline is tight. So, you know, I, I think uh, getting this right out of the gate is very important. Uh, and it's, it's about paying attention to those, uh, to the details and, and really diving into the, the projects um, and, and making sure that you understand the, the, potential, um, the potential for running, it, running things efficiently versus running things uh, inefficiently. And, and I, th I think we offer uh, a fantastic solution set uh, that goes, you know, goes beyond single purpose uh, capability. Um, and uh, we really look forward to partnering with, uh, with well, the partners that we've, we've announced. We're working on additional partnerships um, and, uh, and working hard with our customers uh, to be sure that we're, we're fully understanding their needs and, and, and providing, providing for those. So it's going to be all about execution. The goals have been set. Um, so we know what we have to do, and uh, now it's it's really all about the execution. Tom, thank you so much again to you and all of your colleagues at the Crowley Maritime Corporation. Uh, on behalf of, of DNB and Marine Money, we're extremely grateful for your contribution as well as your commitment to this exciting industry. Have a wonderful day, and thank you again. Thanks, Evan. Really appreciate it.